We also need to talk about the information environment in the same way. And right now, it's being used by whatever scholar is talking about it to mean whatever they're looking at. So some people think that it's just digital media. Some people think it's just news media. This is a problem. Again, I would suggest that what we're talking about is the space where people process information to make sense of the world. And to do that, we use tools from alphabets to AI to process information into things we can share, like outputs of spoken word to videos and everything else that will come along in the future. And the information environment then is all those three things and the relationships between them and the conditions that end up affecting them, like economy and education, et cetera. So we need to look at that bigger system and see how we all slot in. Great, once we have that, then maybe we can go and start looking at information ecosystems. Now, early days to say this, because we haven't been looking at it, but maybe we can look at factors that can be measured over time. Maybe it's things like infrastructure, how it's maintained, how people access it, uh, literacy levels among adults, numeracy levels, capacity for actually processing information, the means through which they do that, the quality of the, let's say, news content that they're, they're accessing. But build that knowledge up over time, and maybe we can start to make comparisons between ecosystems. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast. So we are here in Sausalito, California, at the Hewlett Foundation and the Aspen Digital, the Verify 2024 conference before a live audience of semi-inebriated cybersecurity <laughs> scholars and journalists and practitioners, and I am here on the stage with Alicia Wanless and Chini Sharma, and we are gonna talk about 19th century naturalism. So, we're gonna start with you, Alicia. Um, see, so you all thought we were gonna, we had some uh, like, like real newsmaker thing, but we're gonna talk about a gentleman named Mr. Von Humboldt. Uh, and Alicia, I wanna start <laughs> with you. <laughs> Um, how did we come to be talking about Mr. Von Humboldt on this stage? Because I think you like to torture me. <laughs> uh, no, it was a long and winding path. Uh, so that I researched the information environment. I've been trying to find ways to understand that as a system. Um, and that led me to pursue a PhD at King's College to see if there were ways in which we could apply physical ecology to understanding the information environment. Um, and then through many conversations with Ben, uh, who prompted me to go down different paths around the history of ecology, we end up finding somebody like von Himboldt, who was a Prussian naturalist, who changed Arguably, I'm not an ecologist, and I'm not a. Well, we're going to get. I'm to not a science minute. historian. I just want to clarify because if somebody's in the room who is, we will welcome you on the stage. Yeah, if anybody to, to is a, science, a history of science person or an ecologist, right? Uh, we'll bring you a chair because Come my version is going to be a generalist's history of it. Yeah. But so before he comes along, they're not really looking at it as a system. Natural uh, historians, natural philosophers, they're they're looking at specific parts like botany, uh, plants, etc. And he comes along and he kind of sees this bigger system. He goes down to South America and he sees how colonialists are cutting down trees around this lake and how it is leading to erosion and it's destroying this ecosystem. And so he really starts seeing these things as a, as a collected system that needs to be studied that way. And so he starts documenting things like where plants grow and at what altitude. And this spawns a, a different way of looking at things that informs people like Darwin later, who also takes this more systemic view, and eventually we get to a field of ecology, but it's messy. All right. So Chinny, uh, and just to be clear, this is a subject in which Chinny has uh, even <laughs> less background than Alicia. Um, uh, I just dragooned her into this um, because I thought, like, who would be fun to have on the stage talking about this? And I thought, Chinny. And so here she is. Chinny, uh, in what sense do we use terms like ecology, ecosystem, in uh, talking about information spaces, and to what extent should we understand it as a metaphor, or to what extent should we take it as an aspiration to mean it more literally? I love the way you phrase that question, because we both love it as a metaphor and absolutely don't treat it as the metaphor that it should be. Um, I think that we intuitively in our core seem to understand that information ecosystems 
can be analogized to environmental ecosystems because there is complicated interrelationships between different parties and because when you exert pressure in one area, you have often cascading effects in other parts of the ecosystem. And all of that feels like things that we can wrap our minds around to make sense of a very complicated world. But we don't actually seem to be treating it that way when we make decisions vis-a-vis -vis the information environment because we seem to be playing whack-a-mole more and not actually thinking about it in terms of how making decisions in one part of it impacts other parts of it. And I think there's a second part of it that I feel like is a classic and I'm like being self-deprecating and so I feel like I can say this and beat up on lawyers and policymakers that we don't have the humility that I feel like naturalists had of ethnographically observing the environment and trying to measure the environment. I think that we draw kind of baseless conclusions based on vibes about the information environment rather than have a very principled, disciplined approach to measuring. I actually think we're exactly where naturalists were before they understood it was an ecosystem, that we can just walk in and control it and do whatever we want. All right, so let's, <laughs> let's, let's start there because we look back and we say we analogize this to an ecosystem because we have this idea of ecology, of studying ecosystems, and we have this idea of, of ecosystem management, right, and all of this. Um, but part of what you have argued is that actually we didn't used to have that in the ecosystem space and that that needed to be created. So go back over, admittedly, you're not an environmental historian and all that, <laughs> and we know, we know, we know, but go back over that. How did we used to regard ecosystems and how did the ecology the, the advent of ecology as a discipline changed that. Um, so one, like I was saying before, I think that there's first you have some people who kind of lead us in seeing that there's a system. So there's a simple articulation that people can understand that here we have the system before us. It's complicated. It's interconnected. Then in like 1866, you have this guy, Ernst Haeckel, who comes up with this word ecology, where he's boring from economy in Greek to try to have a way of looking at the system, but he does nothing with it. He doesn't actually become an ecologist. He's a zoologist. He stays in his lane, does nothing more. <laughs> then... 30 years to us. <laughs> but so far out cool. of our lane. It's kind of cool that we're talking about him, though, because it's <laughs> like 150 years later, and he coined the word ecology, and that's pretty cool. And actually. he does not become an ecologist. Even his biographer doesn't index the word ecology. So it's just like it sits there and kind of dies for a little bit. And then in the 1890s, you get these zoologists and, and botanists who start using it and trying to really build a field and systematizing knowledge around that and realizing that there's an interconnection between what they're doing. Um, that's all great, but it kind of persists through the decades as a sum of its parts. So you have botanists, zoologists, you get people who are looking at ecosystems, and they all kind of stay in their stream under an umbrella, but not necessarily coming together. And then in the 60s, you get this book, Silent Spring, by Rachel Carson, that really thrusts ecology into the mainstream. This is kind of complicated, because on one hand, you've got a lot of people who are very concerned about pollution in the environment, and coming together to be able to prove that certain pesticides and stuff are causing problems. So you get disciplines converging to be able to do that. But you also get a confusion of what the term means. Because now it starts to become about environmental protection and not the study of the environment and organisms in relation to it. So we get this kind of bastardization of the term um, that becomes hard to, to understand. And we have that now in the use of the metaphor. All right. So when... You use the phrase information ecology, which I attribute to you as a coinage, and you always say to me, no, it existed before that. <laughs> but I think of it as your thing. What does information ecology mean to you? So to me, information ecology is the study of the information environment. So not, it's not information environmentalism. We need to clean it up and have a super fund. No. <laughs> But I would take a super fund to build a research center to get us to the point of understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To so to all the funders out there. Um, but what are the things that in the early ecology movement we learn to measure? And what are the things now that we need to learn to measure if we take this metaphor seriously? It, 
there's, so there's many really good examples of studying things over time that give us answers about problems that happen. So um, one example, I'm going to show my age because I feel like this problem's been dealt with pretty well, but when I was a kid, acid rain was a problem. And you had, uh, where I'm Canadian, and you had a town called Sudbury, and all the lakes around it were dying. And there, at the same time, you had, because people knew about acid rain from the 1860s, and they'd actually had um, studies measuring the pollution in rain, the acidity of rain, since about 1872. And around 1860, or 1963, in the northern US, you get a study, a long-term study, that shows that the acidity in rain is like 100 times worse than it should be. So there's a clue. Maybe this is the problem. Something's happening with pollution. Um, also in Ontario, you had this program where they had kept some lakes in northern Ontario quite clean. So they had some sort of natural state to compare it against. So they started uh, increasing the pH level in some of these pristine lakes to see what would happen. And sure enough, the, the fish and the plant life start dying. When they stopped introducing more pH levels in it, they were able to rebound pretty quickly. And so the hypothesis was, perhaps we have a pollution problem. Now, coupled with air quality measurements, they were able to see that you also had this air pollution that's probably causing the acid rain and these things are happening. You get a collective movement in North America to be able to stop introducing those pollutants, and we have not as much an acid rain problem anymore. People aren't talking about it. But to do that, you had to have historical measurements of the quality of rain, what's happening, the air quality. You had to have something to compare it against, some sort of baseline to be able to understand. We don't really have that in the information environment because we aren't looking at ecosystems in that way. We don't really have baselines to know what it was before a new technology comes in or a pandemic happens or any of these things that might be changing it. All right, but... Somebody here will say there are all these studies, there are all these case studies, there's all these looks at, you know, bot farms, right, at, uh, so Chinny, what is happening in the study of the information space today and what is not happening? To what extent does the study of the space look like a systematic ecology and to what extent is it something else, and how would you describe what else it is? I like something else, and I kind of just want to leave it at that, because I don't know that I do a better job of explaining what it is. I think that our study, and to recognize that I'm in my lane, I am a legal academic, so that's like a very narrow lane, but I do spend a lot of time reading a lot of things that other people write, purporting to study the information environment, and I think that we have very good uh, motivations in doing this, but we do it in very siloed ways. I think that we have security individuals that are studying like network security and decisions made around technical decisions and OPSEC and the human factor. And then I think we have individuals that care about normative ideology and the impact this is having on individuals and the existential question about what happens when we don't know what truth is anymore. And then I think we have people that are talking about like the legal ecosystem and how these laws are interacting with each other and whether they're doing the things that we want them to do. But none of these separate, separate fields are interacting with each other, asterisks. Some people are trying to do this, but it's not happening systematically or at the scale that you would want it to. And so it's not accomplishing what I think actually having a scientific approach to an information ecosystem that we might want because we don't have common definitions. We don't have a general understanding of what the other disciplines that are related to our field do, and so we can't communicate with them, and we don't seem to have an understanding that if we make decisions in our own little silo, uh, it will have unintended and unanticipated effects in other silos that might be contrary to what we want to accomplish. And so that seems to be the status quo. What would be nice if we had a major culture shift in how we think about the information ecosystem so that what we do in practice matches up with how we talk about it in terms of analogies, where we do think of it as this is kind of the complex natural environment we live in. It is happening. We don't understand it. We should observe it. We should measure it. We should come up with hypotheses. We should test them. We should not ascribe like normative values to them because then we're coming in with biases into our study. We should just be trying to understand what's happening and we should be working with other people in other disciplines and defer to their expertise and kind of bring them in when 
they're relevant to our work. I want to try to imagine what, you know, the von Humboldt-like research agenda really looks like here. Let's imagine that you said, we're going we're gonna to actually treat this, we're going to take this metaphor seriously, and we're going to treat the information space like an ecosystem or a series of ecosystems, and we're going to study it like ecologists, and we're not going to we're not going to slam our fists on the table and say we need to do something about you know Yevgeny Prigozhin or about so and so. We're actually just going to try to understand the space and declare a moratorium on public policy until, as Donald Trump would say, we figure out what's going on, right? So I want to I want to start with Alicia and then go to Chinny. What does that look like? You have to find things to measure. You have to find things to study. Tell me what we can measure and what we, what's, the, what's the equivalent of measuring levels of acid rain in, in, in pools of water in Ontario. Can I go on a different rant first? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's a, a different ecologist that I would say should guide us, and that's E.O. Wilson. And he wrote a book on consilience and the idea that there was a problem in ecology still in his day, which is very recently, in which you don't have people speaking the same language and they need to speak the same language across disciplines. So one is that we start talking about the same thing. Uh, information itself is a contested concept, and lots of people mean very different things when they're talking about it. So give me an example of that. Uh, well, some scholars believe that information is inherently true, where others do not believe that it has to be inherently true, partly because people process information and they may be doing it faulty, and that doesn't mean that the way that they come to an end in that is actually truth. And then there's whole issues around truth and what that means and how that's processed. So I would posit that information is really that which has been processed to be able to share with other people. So it is neither true nor false. It can be many things. It is just processed in a way that other people might be able to consume it. Okay. <laughs> but then we also need to talk about the information environment in the same way. And right now, it's being used by whatever scholar is talking about it to mean whatever they're looking at. So some people think that it's just digital media. Some people think it's just news media. This is a problem. Again, I would suggest that what we're talking about is the space where people process information to make sense of the world. And to do that, we use tools from alphabets to AI to process information into things we can share, like outputs of spoken word to videos and everything else that will come along in the future. And the information environment then is all those three things and the relationships between them and the conditions that end up affecting them, like economy and education, et cetera. So we need to look at that bigger system and see how we all slot in. Great, once we have that, then maybe we can go and start looking at information ecosystems. Now, early days to say this, because we haven't been looking at it, but maybe we can look at factors that can be measured over time. Maybe it's things like infrastructure, how it's maintained, how people access it, uh, literacy levels among adults, numeracy levels, capacity for actually processing information, the means through which they do that, the quality of the, let's say, news content that they're, they're accessing. But build that knowledge up over time, and maybe we can start to make comparisons between ecosystems. So lots of people like to trot out Finland as a great example that's dealt with disinformation, but that ecosystem's really unique. It's a small country of like five million people. And it's, they speak Finnish. It's super homogenous. There's no other, like it's a, it's a pretty unique language. Yes, it's a Finno-Ugric language, but like nobody else can actually understand it. They have high levels of education. They have high investment into a public broadcaster that they widely trust. Tell me, what does the U.S. look like in comparison to that? Does it sound like anything like the U.S.? No, obviously. <laughs> As I understand what you're saying, I want to try to break it down. You want to start by mutual definition of term. Yes. And then work from there toward something that you can measure based on common agreement of those terms. Yes, and factors that can be repeated, because that's the other thing that we're missing that ecology has. And again, different, not ecology, but like atmospheric studies, this is how we understand that there's climate change. A century of measurements of water temperatures, air temperatures, pollution, all of these things go together for us to understand that something's changing and problematic over the last hundred years. We need that equivalent. 
I think there is a great asymmetry between the ecology movement and this movement. I want to surface it. The first element of it is that this has happened in reverse order. So in the ecology movement, you have a bunch of people start studying things. And then they produce all kinds of information, all kinds of measurements, all kinds of capacity and knowledge. And then about 100 years later, Rachel Carson writes a book that says environmentalism. And you have all this this capacity to address environmental questions because people have been weird people (laughs) have been studying plants for a long time and measuring things. Here, it's happened in the opposite order, right? The 2016 election happened, and uh, a whole bunch of people got harassed online in Gamergate, right? And we all went around shrieking, silent spring, right? We got to do something, and we hadn't done the work yet. And that creates, when you do do the work, a lot of motivated reasoning in how you design studies and how you think about things and what your presumptions are about what actions should be. And so, Alicia, I want to ask you, would the ecology movement have worked if Rachel Carson had written the book first? Ooh, I, I actually think it would have been massively detrimented, and I have an example of why. It, it has, and she continues to be criticized and attacked in ways that I, I'm going to say I feel like only a woman is really going to understand about how they're attacked. I'm setting that aside. So um, the premise like, of her book was really about pesticides and, and the problems of what they were causing. And around the same time, you have uh, ecologists who are noticing that bird eggs are thinning. Peregrine like falcons. The shell yes, egg. the shells are thinning and they're not able to reproduce. And this is extremely problematic, but because of historic egg collections, they know that it's happening at about the time that DDT is introduced into the environment and being used heavily. Now, to try to prove that it was DDT, they took it and fed it to the falcons in experiments, but it didn't replicate the problem. They weren't leading to egg thinning, which is extremely, like a big issue if you believe that it's DDT. Uh, the issue is that falcons are a bird of prey. They don't experience DDT directly. They pick it up along the food chain. So they pick it up as a byproduct called DDE. And when they understood that that's how it's breaking down in the system, you have to understand the food chain, then they were able to do experiments and they reproduce the, the outcome. And they also found DDE in the wild in these thinning eggs. Um, So they were able to isolate it eventually, but it required both historic egg collections to be able to understand that. It required understanding how things actually move through the food chain, a systems analysis of this. It required historic measurements again. And this is all great. They solved the problem. But to this day, people are arguing to have DDT reintroduced in places because they say, look, that study failed to prove it in the beginning, it isn't the case. And a lot of our research, when it comes to experiments on things like social media, are a lot like that now, where they go head to head to say, Facebook's causing this, Twitter's causing this, and I'm not sure that it's really replicating it that way. And then you get another experiment that says, no, it's not. And they're canceling each other out. And this is why, you know, how do we move forward if one study cancels out the other one? Right, so so that strikes me as a very serious methodological problem, that there was something that the early naturalists are able to be disinterested um, because there's no, I, I mean, not disinterested in the profound, like the ultimate sense, but more doing this because they're curious about stuff rather than that they sense an urgent problem that they need to address. And I I think the difference is is that you had multiple methods that can converge to understand a complex system. And right now, most of our research when it comes to the information environment is built up of two predominant types of work, case studies on problems that we face and experiments that are usually out of context of that wider system. And that's not enough for us to piece together or find causation and figure out what the best point of intervention would be. So your answer to that is go way down into the tectonic plates. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, all right. I'm just trying to isolate it. 
I think we need to systematize research, look at what we have to say, look, we can only get so far with this type of research. It's only gonna tell us that we have a problem. It doesn't tell us what to do about the problem. If we look at how experiments are constructed, are they actually situated in that complex system? What might they be missing? Is this type of media more important than that type of media? What are all the ways in which- So you want, to, you want a deep understanding, a deep of the way the information space operates. Hell yeah. I feel like there's like a, <laughs> Uh, a different kind of research, though, to the problem-solving research. I feel like the reason problem-solving in naturalist research could happen is because there was a large foundation of very boring, not addressing a very pressing, hitting-the-news problem kind of research about how environments worked. And so we had kind of a foundation of knowledge that we could build off of and say, like, this is how we understand the science to work. Now let's use it to apply to, like, why are eggshells thinning in certain environments? And I feel like we only ever started to care about information ecosystems to solve problems that have already had like value judgments made about them. I don't know. Do you agree? I'm not going to make any friends in the room with what I'm about to say. I think no new friends. that for a long time, the way that we go about studying aspects of the information environment is driven by a cycle of media coverage on one hand in which they'll be like, I don't know, a new technology that comes out and everybody says, look, it's so amazing. It's going to change the world. And that gets a lot of coverage. And then you get governments and everybody else saying, how can we adopt this new technology? What does that mean? And then you're going to get some researchers who are like, wait a minute, put the brakes on. This is crazy. All these things can go wrong. This has happened before. And then you get this cycle of funding the research like this, then that leads to more coverage. And we have a cycle where something like disinformation is covered heavily for a few years. Uh, or before that, violent extremism. Now we have AI and we continuously repeat this. The problem is that it doesn't matter what said problem, said technology is, we will face the same thing the next time because we never got a grasp of where it's being introduced and how that might have been changed. Or even before that happened, like in a banal world, how does information get consumed and transmitted and processed and created and how does that impact non-information environments? Right. And who controls it? And just because something new comes in doesn't mean we stop doing old things. Like we didn't stop talking because we could write. We haven't stopped using videos and sometimes they get incorporated in new ways, right? Like we had new messaging apps and they were text and no, now we have the voice notes. Like we just, it's always evolving and it's always changing and it's always becoming more complex. One of the things that we had in the ecological space was a pretty sophisticated understanding of things like taxonomies, things like geography, you know, ideas that that uh, certain plants would grow in certain areas but not in others, right? We had a, a pretty deep working understanding of the components of the various ecosystems. And here I go back and forth and I say, well, in some ways, like, we built all these systems. We actually know a lot about how Facebook works. We know even more about how a newspaper works, right? We have a lot of experience with these things. Like, what is the sense in which we do and don't understand the information space? I mean, it's all manufactured, okay, right? It's all, it's all stuff we did. It seems apparent, like you think you know what this newspaper is and how it works, but do you actually know who owns it? Do you know how it makes money? Do you know what their editorial control is? Do you know how many people are actually consuming it? Okay, outside of the U.S., I mean, you guys have way more stats than everybody else, which is great, yay. We don't. <laughs> the rest of the world kind of, like, is lacking. It's really difficult in Canada to find out what news media is being consumed, who owns it, how much have they been consolidated, who controls Don't it. all Canadians read the Globe and Mail and McLean? No, we've got Fox News broadcast into the country since 2004, which tells us we're a tyranny and helps, you know, get protests going. It's amazing. <laughs> all right, let's go to the audience. <laughs> oh, I can't beat that. All right, I want to ask a question, and you just started to answer it, in fact. Uh, it sounds like you're trying to imagine uh, a new field of study for this, for information ecology, and you have both talked about being interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, getting out of our silos. 
where do you see the most appeal? Who are the people who need to be coming together? And one of the great things about this room that we're all in is that we all occupy different spaces. And it's in the fact that we're a network that slightly all has different perspective that you learn something new. So who are you most excited to learn from? Who do you want to connect with in this field that you are trying to imagine? Wow. I mean, okay, I have a narrow one where it starts, where I'm like, I'm just really keen to meet anybody who's like, yes, we need to study systems and we need to go in this approach. So there. But uh, there's lots of fields that come together in this. You've got people in media studies. You've got legal scholars. Uh, you've got people who deal with all the infrastructure and everything that's being built. You've got people who deal with all the software components that happen there. You have people who are actually trying to implement policies. You've got cool people who are going out to people and trying to say, like, how would you actually see this and understand this? And how would you be involved in it and how can we build trust in that so like everyone <laughs> so I have done work on interoperability and there's uh, a lot of conversation on like digital identity and digital sovereignty and like owning your person persona online and I was talking to someone who's worked in that space for a long time and is now doing a master's or maybe a PhD in anthropology to understand kind of the conception of identity over time and I was like, wow, it is interesting that we're sitting here trying to resolve the issue of identity within an ecosystem without understanding how human beings have thought of and related to their identity vis-a-vis -vis other people over time. And then the second group of people, so I, there's a woman who uh, was at the Integrity Institute and is now at Harvard doing research that studied in a divinity school and understanding kind of how uh, theology plays out in other ecosystems, like the framework of it, not necessarily the substance of it, and how like rights and morality and ethics trickles up from a population or gets pushed down on a population is also really interesting to me because that's exactly what we're trying to do with like the norms we're trying to engender. And then I am excited to work with engineers because I feel like they get a bad reputation as individuals that don't want to talk to other people. But I have had engineers that are willing to offer so much of their time to talk to me, to help me understand what they do and why they do it. And so I feel like that's we're all sleeping on just like the line engineer at companies. Dustin Boltz, Wall Street Journal. Um, I, I'm, I'm sensing that this, this discussion is sort of indicating that there might be shortcomings in uh, the media's coverage of some of these issues that we care about, uh, that this conference is about in the cybersecurity, disinformation, AI world, uh, and that sort of what you're describing here in this um, sort of interdisciplinary ecos uh, information ecosystem has contributed to perhaps uh, shortcomings in media coverage. And so I, I, I guess I just wanted to put the question to you if, if, if that is a correct uh, takeaway from what you're saying. Um, and, and how we can remedy that, and, and to what degree, in the absence of a, a stronger ecosystem, what can media do internally uh, to be more self-corrective if, if we're not at the place where we want to be you know, writ large uh, uh, in this world? Well, I just want to say, uh, 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 jokes aside, uh, that is precisely the type of uh, institutional self-reflection that uh, this is designed to engender, not particularly on the part of the press, but, um, but I think a, there's a lot of actors in the space, and media is not chief among them in my mind, but is among them, uh, that don't ask the question, what is our role in defining the terms of this conversation? And, and I, 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 I don't think the media is the chief actor here, but I do think the media amplify lots of actors in a fashion that contributes to exactly the cycle that Alicia was describing before. And I, I, I think the, the eagerness with which large numbers of actors, press included, engage that cycle repetitively rather than say, hey, wait a minute, what do we really know here and what don't we know is not a healthy, it's not a healthy cycle. I, I don't know, I, I jumped in, but, but. I, okay, first, there's no chief, like, problem. I work across all stakeholder types and 
one of the things that is painfully apparent is that we all have operating constraints and we all have challenges in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And that that impacts how things come out, right? So like media, you guys are pressed to come up with stories really quickly all the time. And not only that, you're in this high-paced environment in which you're all competing for eyeballs and attention and your companies are all competing for money as well. And it's just, it's a cycle. And researchers are all chasing dollars and funding that is set by certain topics and that will impact what they do and how they do it. It also impedes their ability to be able to cooperate with each other. Civil society is pretty much project-based. It's a horrible cycle that they get stuck in. That means that they're also just chasing things. Uh, you've got governments who are all working in, in silos and policymakers who are pressed to do something. He was making some jokes off the top because this drives me nuts. But again, I understand where this is coming from. You get a minister that comes in and says, I need to do something now, and we have to find some sort of solution. It doesn't matter that there are no answers out there and they can't sift through this completely unsystematized research to get to an answer. And then tech companies. I'll just let you all deal with tech companies. I'm just, I'm not even going to bother. But they've got <laughs> challenges that make it hard for them to do what they do. And I know nobody wants to have any sympathy for them. Cool. We're all screwed in our own ways. Uh, and I think, though, what that does is it means that we don't actually get anybody really with the space or the time to be able to say, wait a minute, how do we get above that? How do we actually get stakeholders to work better together? How do we get out of these cycles where research isn't translating into policy? How do we actually get to see the system and make this work? And that's one of the biggest gaps that we have. And I I mean, I've got ideas on how we get out of that, but like, it's going to also just take people who can see that system and want to build towards it. So no, I'm not blaming you guys for all of the problems in the world. We all contribute to it. We're all part of it. Hi. To take the ecology metaphor a little bit further, I was reading a pretty interesting New York Times story about geoengineering and how controversial it is. And I'm wondering what you think of the ethics of interventions in something like a natural environment or an environment that you're describing in sort of naturalistic terms? Well, I think we've made a lot of mistakes as humans uh, to try to control our environment uh, that has not led to great consequences. And that is what worries me about how we go about intervening in other spaces. We're not a great species for you know thinking through long-term consequences. <laughs> I feel like what a lot of scientists seem to, or at least environmentalists seem to say is like, do less, like get, get out of the way. Like there is an ecosystem that is like, like they kind of think of environment as an inevitability and we just need to kind of get out of the way and allow it to kind of find the homeostasis that it is good at finding without excessive intervention that throws it so far off course that now, and, and, and it will self-correct, but maybe not in the way that we want. This is a terrible kind of analogy, but I just recently learned about natural lawns and how people are moving back towards not having curated lawns. And I was like, what a silly thing that aesthetically we decided to do that had such negative impacts on the environment. I mean, I think the information environment's different in the sense that we don't have a natural state. And if we did, it's probably way back when. And I don't think any of us really want to go that far back. Uh, so I think there's certain interventions that we could hopefully mostly get behind, like education. I think that's a good thing. Literacy rates, stuff like that, are things that we might want to do. I think there's also ways in which governments can help us get ahead in terms of regulation, like putting out regulation that helps us get transparency reporting on types of companies that may be controlling how we access information and what we get access to, um, but also in supporting large-scale research that might get us to some better answers of what the system is. Yeah, I just, I, I, I do think one of the really interesting components of your question is the absence of a, of, of a natural state and the fact that all components of these ecosystems, and this may point to the limits of ecology as a framework here, but all components of the metaphor or of the ecosystem are themselves interventions in it. And so there's no, there's no analogy to simply disengaging and let, you know, letting nature heal, right? There's, uh, I mean, ev everything anybody does to contribute to the information ecosystem is itself an intervention. It's so interesting. I'm not pushing back on that. I just intuitively 
not at all studying this to the degree that other people on this panel are, would think that there is at least some sort of a natural state in information because that's just how things exist on the planet, that there is a state and then you exert influence and then you see how it changes that state. But that's, you know, maybe the a big blind spot and an assumption I'm bringing. Well, it would be great if we had like some way to measure that. It'd be really <laughs> cool. Govind, I think you get the last question today. Thank you. I probably have two quick ones. One is, I mean, if you look at the Borges' story on exactitude of science, he says your cartography becomes such a precise uh, field of study that only the entire map of an empire will suffice to map the empire itself. So to what extent do we map this, right? Is it to service, in the service of understanding how this information ecosystem ecology functions? Is it to find a solution or is it to possibly just try and figure out interrelationships? And the second question is, I always hear about how human beings back in the day did not cause climate change because, well, we were not, you know, progressing forward towards something, right? If you have to feed 8 billion people, then you have to like cause some imbalance in the system. So if you, it was not fertilizers, it would have not been possible to feed 8 billion people. So what are the counterfactuals, right? Like what are the things that we are not considering with the presence of information? I think, well, number one, having studied, you know, propaganda and history and how things can be abused, like language engineering, nationalism, propaganda, et cetera, I think there is a big risk in terms of getting to an understanding of the information environment and having people abuse it. So some people in this room may have heard me talk before about the idea of having a CERN for the information environment. So you have like an international multinational, not international, but a multinational center so that if one backslides, it can't really be co-opted and you kind of have ethics around how you're going to study this and deal with this thing. I think that that's necessary and I think that that needs to go in tandem. We can't just go off and try to find a science to explain the information environment and not expect that it's going to be abused. I mean, everything that comes out from humans, somebody is going to try to abuse it. So that's a problem. Uh, I do think, though, that there is a need for us to understand how we relate to information and each other and how that informs the systems that we create and what that means for individuals inside that system. So yes, it's about understanding, but it's also about the governance models that we end up creating and how are those better or worse for the people living in it? And how do we get out of that? How do we move forward? How do we create and construct better systems and get people to want to be a part of them that they aren't crushing people? So I think that, that everything happens in the information environment. Democracy happens in the information environment. The choices we make about climate change happen there. So if we don't get a grasp on it, I'm not sure how we make collective decisions in the better interest of humanity and the planet longer term. We are going to leave it there. Alicia Wanless, Chini Sharma, uh, thank you for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for sticking it out to the end. <laughs>The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Folks, you need to help us promote the Lawfare Podcast. So share this episode. You know, there are so many new social media networks. You can share it on Blue Sky. You can share it on Mastodon. You can share it on Spoutable. You can share it on Post.News. Even if you're not on X or Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest. Share it wherever you are. We need your help. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by the one, the only, Jen Patia. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.